Hello, my name is Olivia Mattis. I'm delighted to welcome this nice big crowd to join us tonight, exceptionally on a Thursday night, for an exceptional program on the theme of the United States and the Holocaust. We at the Susan Mendes Foundation, we honor a hero, a rescuer. Normally we present programs to do with rescue and resistance. Of course, the United States and the Holocaust is a very big subject. There were American rescuers, but it is a very, very large and complex subject. And we are very privileged to have two world's authorities on this subject. Um, so let me tell you who they are. We have Dr. Raphael Medoff who is the founding director of the, David, of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies. And he's the author of more than 20 books about the Holocaust. Uh, not only the Holocaust, but Zionism and American Jewish history. Dr. Medoff has taught Jewish history at Ohio State University, Purchase College of, the, of SUNY, State University of New York, and currently Yeshiva University. He's also a fellow of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University in Israel. His latest book, which I highly recommend, is America and the Holocaust, a documentary history published by the Jewish Publication Society and the University of Nebraska Press. And with us as well is Marty Ostro, who is a filmmaker. He's a producer, a writer, and a director for public, commercial, and cable television. His award-winning films include America and the Holocaust, Deceit and Indifference for the PBS series, The American Experience. His many films about science for Nova, PBS, and the Discovery Channel include Race to Save the Planet, the first large-scale PBS effort to bring environmental concerns to national consciousness, and Renewal, the first documentary to tell the story the stories of America's growing religious environmental movement. In addition, his public television films about the arts have earned him three Emmy Awards. Martin Ostro's films have been seen in festivals around the world, and it's my honor and privilege to turn the program now to our first speaker, Dr. Raphael Medoff. Thanks, Olivia. Good evening, everyone. You know, when I was watching the Ken Burns film, The U.S. and the Holocaust, over the last few evenings, as I'm sure many of you were, at a number of points, I stopped and I, I, I almost asked myself, who was the president of the United States from 1933 to 1945? Was it Franklin Roosevelt or was it Breckinridge Long, the assistant secretary of state, whom Burns again and again presented almost as if uh, he, Long, was in charge of U.S. immigration policy. The, um, the remarkable um, underlying theme of Burns's six-hour series on PBS um, was to minimize President Roosevelt's responsibility for America's policy of shutting the doors to most Jewish refugees and of uh, being unwilling to take even minimal steps to interrupt the mass murder of the Jews in Europe. But those policies were not decided by the State Department. They were decided by the president. This is true, of course, of, of every president and every State Department. Um, it's the president who decides policy, and the State Department is one of the branches of government that implements that policy. President Roosevelt um, is someone whom we all revere as a strong and decisive leader. Those are among the um, outstanding qualities for which we remember him, leading America out of the Great Depression and, and leading us, of course, in, um, in World War II to the brink of victory. He was never a prisoner of the State Department, of, of any kind of what today some people would call a deep state. Um, but in this case, I guess that would be the deep State Department as if there were a government bureaucrats behind the scenes who somehow controlled what the president did. That's, that runs completely contrary to what historians um, have documented in countless books about uh, FDR, his presidency, and his foreign policy. 
Where Breckenridge Long and the State Department um, come into the story in an accurate rendering of the historical record of America's response to Nazism in the Holocaust is the, the specific area of, um, of admitting or rejecting uh, Jewish uh, refugees who were seeking visas to the United States in the 30s and also in the 1940s. The, um, the, the process by which a German Jewish refugee would seek admission to um, the U.S. was um, complicated, it was arduous, it required all sorts of, um, of guarantees and, 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 and a, a ton of paperwork. Um, Professor David Wyman used to refer to the, this bureaucratic nightmare as, as a series of paper walls that were designed to keep Jewish refugees out. President Roosevelt did not invent the immigration quota system that was in place during his administration. He inherited that from his predecessors, but he took a bad and restrictive system and made it much worse. He did this by having the State Department add on all kinds of extra requirements and regulations that made it extremely difficult for Jewish refugees to qualify to enter the U.S. We know this was not some independent idea of the State Department because there are documents uh, in which President Roosevelt um, explicitly acknowledges his awareness of the fact that, and this is the key point, the quotas were constantly unfilled or underfilled. The quota for Germany in the 1930s was about 26,000. That was the maximum number of German citizens, in this case, almost all Jews, who could come to America in any given year. But that quota of 26,000 was filled in only one year of FDR's 12 years as president. And in most of those years, that quota was less than 25% filled. Unused quota places did not then roll over into the next year. They were simply discarded. And, um, and during the Holocaust period, ultimately, more than 190,000 quota places from Germany or German-occupied countries were never used. So that's 190,000 Jews who could have come to America during those years um, within the existing quota system without trying to liberalize um, the immigration laws. This crucial fact is not explained um, anywhere in Ken Burns's film. The fact that the quotas were deliberately left unfilled, the fact that there were so many empty quota places. Instead, the film uh, portrays Roosevelt as some kind of a helpless prisoner of public opinion and, of course, of, of the sinister State Department, as if, um, as if FDR had no choice but to simply go along with whatever the latest public opinion polls showed. Now, it's certainly true that most of the public in the 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression, was opposed to more immigration, and most uh, members of Congress were also. But when we speak of the unfilled quotas, we're, we're pointing to an opportunity that Roosevelt had to allow greater admission of Jews without starting any fights over the immigration laws, without a, a big a big public controversy or a, or a battle with Congress. It's something he could have quietly done by simply instructing the State Department to permit the quota to be filled each year. It was his choice. It was President Roosevelt's choice not to do that. It was his policy to suppress Jewish refugee immigration far below the existing laws. In the, in the Burns film, as you saw, um, the example of, of Anne Frank's family is used as, um, as an illustration of the complications that were faced by German Jews who wanted to come to the United States. Although, as we know, of course, the Franks ultimately went into hiding um, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, they were German citizens. And so when, they, when Anne's father, Otto Frank, applied for permission to enter the US, he did so through the German quota. We see in the Burns film um, a portrayal of Otto Frank's application process, which leaves us with the impression that it was just too bad, but there were so many complications in the way. And at one point, the paperwork um, was destroyed in a, in a German bombing, so he had to file the applications again and so forth. And it all sounds like kind of just a sad tale of a lot of annoying bureaucracy. What Burns never tells us, the viewers, 
is that when Otto Frank applied for his visa in 1941, the quota for German citizens to, to reach America was only 47% filled. More than half of the German quota that year um, was left unused. So there was plenty of room for families like the Franks. Um, if only President Roosevelt had been inclined to just use the existing quotas and the, exist, the existing um, opportunities. The story of the, of the unfilled quotas and other crucial aspects of this, of this um, chapter of history that are not told in the Ken Burns film were told when, um, when the first film on this subject was made some years ago, which was Martin Ostrow's America and the Holocaust, also for PBS, but back in the 1990s. Um, in, in that film, we, um, we saw the story of, of attempts by Jewish refugees to find haven in America told largely through the story of a different and, and not, not known um, uh, immigrant. So whereas Burns used the story of Anne Frank, um, Marty, you used uh, a, a Jewish refugee by the name of Kurt Klein. And I wonder if you would tell us a little more about your film um, and also about uh, your choice to uh, to use Kurt Klein as one of the um, as one of the major voices in in your story. Sure, I'd be I'd be glad to. And um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I I would like to. Um, say that many people who are watching this evening have probably seen the Burns film or part of the film. And I imagine that many people have not seen uh, America and the Holocaust, the film that I did that aired originally in 1994 and that uh, was rebroadcast by PBS in 1999. So um, I think it may be helpful if we're talking about these, these two different films for me just to spend a, a minute or two just to try to characterize the film that I that I did, um, um, and as um, as you mentioned, um, their film really revolves around one central figure, and we we filmed the gentleman's name is Kurt Klein. He was seventy two years old when we filmed him, um, and he he relates his struggle, and he was a German Jew came to America. Um, in 1937 at age 17. Um, and um, uh, his sister arrived the year before and he arrived and his, his brother, his older brother arrived the year later. And uh, with his siblings, he dedicated himself to trying to save the lives of his parents uh, who were still in Germany, his elder parents to bring them to the safety of America from Germany. Um, and we see his struggle threaded through the background story of all of the complex forces that were at work in America in the 1930s. Um, the depression, the uh, e extreme forces for isolationism, for nativism, and of course the, the undercurrent of anti-Semitism that was pervasive. Um, and as we watch Kurt's story, we, we come to understand that his um, four-year struggle to, 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 to save his parents' lives, which ended in tragedy, um, um, was more of a struggle uh, against uh, the policies of the American government than it was against the policies of Nazi Germany. That's kind of the first half of our film does that. The second half of the film takes us um, from, well, it takes us into and through the war. And um, in that part, um, we, it, we look at the decisions that were made by people in government who had positions of power to make a difference uh, in this complex set of circumstances, um, in this uh, horrendous, enormous uh, refugee and uh, genocide catastrophe. And, um, and we, we really sort of see how the choices that were primarily made by FDR and his State Department, how those choices um, were tragically impactful for thousands of Jewish refugees um, like Kurt Klein's parents. 
So that's the story that we that we told in this 90 minute film. And it couldn't be more different in tone and feeling than uh, Ken Burns's uh, film. I'm not trying to say that one is a better way is the only way to do things. Filmmakers have various ways of approaching their material. But I think that we did um, a very effective job of telling one coherent, powerful, strong story that is emotional and you understand all of the forces that Kurt Klein was up against. It was just shocking when, when we got to know Kurt, when he came onto our radar screen, how his personal story just matched piece by piece by piece, the things that were going on behind the scenes in the State Department, the plans that were made, the secret plans that Breckenridge Long outlined to postpone the granting of visas, things like that. And so um, it just, perfectly matched up with what was going on. Things that Kurt never knew, even at the point when I first met Kurt in 1991, he was still largely unaware of the forces that he had been up against as a young man trying to save his parents' lives. He just didn't know what was hidden behind the screen. And so that's, um, that's, that's part of, um, of, of, of our story of how it came together. Let's talk a little bit about another important episode in this chapter of history, which appears both in your film, Marty, and in Burns' film. And that's the voyage of the infamous refugee ship, the St. Louis. Sure. In 1939, as we all know, the St. Louis uh, sailed from Germany with 930 Jewish refugees aboard. It was um, turned away from Cuba where it first attempted to land, and then hovered off the coast of Florida for several days as the passengers sent telegrams to the White House pleading for admission to the United States. I mentioned earlier that the German quota was unfilled in all but one year, from 33 to 45. It happens that was the year, 1939, when the St. Louis arrived. That was the one year when the German quota was filled. So it's certainly true, as we see in the Burns film, um, that President Roosevelt could not have simply um, admitted them unilaterally to the United States. Um, there was no room in the quota for that brief moment. But what is, um, what is glaring in its, um, in, in its absence from the Burns film is any acknowledgement that there was anything else that FDR could have done. Now, this is not just a Monday morning quarterback, historians looking back with the benefit of hindsight and trying to say he could have done this or could have done that. I'm going to refer here to something that was raised at the time, um, and not by one of Roosevelt's critics, but rather by a member of his own cabinet, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau Jr. We know from transcripts that Morgenthau made that he contacted Secretary of State Cordell Hull while the St. Louis was off the coast of Florida, and he raised the idea of allowing the refugees to go temporarily to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Hull told Morgenthau he would consult with the president, and then we have a follow-up conversation where Hull came back to Morgenthau and he said, I'm sorry, we can't let them into the Virgin Islands. Now, listen to the reason why. The, um, the requirement to receive the kind of visa they would have needed, a tourist visa, which is good for six months, the requirement is that the applicant needs to have a safe a permanent return address to which he will go back when the six months are up. Well, Hull said to Morgenthau, these Jews don't have a safe place to go. They're fleeing from Nazi Germany, where there was just this major pogrom, Kristallnacht, a few months earlier. So therefore, we can't allow them into the Virgin Islands. Now, think about what a catch-22 that was. What FDR and Hull were saying was, we're not going to let them into um, this safe haven, the Virgin Islands, because it's not safe to go back to Nazi Germany. Therefore, we're going to turn them away, meaning they would have to go back to Nazi Germany. And in fact, as far as everyone knew, when the St. Louis began making its way back across the Atlantic, it was going back to Germany. What happened, of course, is that um, American Jewish negotiators were able to work out um, agreements with four other European countries, England, France, Holland, and Belgium, to each take a portion of those refugees. 
Uh, those who went to England, of course, were saved because the Germans never were able to invade the United Kingdom. But those who went to Holland and Belgium and France were murdered at about the same rate as other Jews in those countries when the Germans overran those three countries uh, the following year. Marty, in your film, you chose to use a very interesting image about the St. Louis. And I wonder if we could, we could see that image and if you could tell us a little bit about why you chose um, to include um, this particular graphic in your film. Sure. <clears throat> this is, you know, the, I think filmmakers are usually looking for um, ways that are less than obvious um, to tell the story. And uh, we could have just, just included a, a, a still image of, of the uh, still photograph of the of the ship. And we came across this political cartoon and thought, oh, this really says so much more. It's so so much more evocative. It's got feeling and 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 it also tells us something about the fact that that the awareness, what the level of awareness must have been at the time as people were following the story in the news. I mean, people generally don't publish uh, political cartoons about extremely uh, obscure subjects. So it tells us that in a moment when you look at it, oh, people must have known about this and people must have been following it. And so they didn't even have to put the name, the precise name of the ship that's just called refugee ship in the cartoon. And of course, the Statue of Liberty is the iconic image that speaks for itself. And we just thought it was it was a more powerful way than just putting a simple picture of the St. Louis. There were so many that we could have chosen from that. I'd like to say um, something briefly about the treatment of the Holocaust rescuer Varian Fry in the Ken Burns film. Um, Fry was a private American citizen who went to uh, Vichy, France, uh, in 1940, at the behest of a, a group called the Emergency Rescue Committee, a refugee advocacy group. And he went there for the purpose of smuggling refugees, most of them Jews, um, out of France. Many of these refugees were uh, famous uh, intellectuals, artists, um, political activists, people like Marc Chagall, Hannah Arendt, and, and others. The, um, the Fry rescue mission uh, caused controversy. That is with the Vichy French rulers and their Nazi, um, the, 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 the Nazi government, which was um, over them. Um, the Germans and the French and the Vichy French both complained to Washington, to the Roosevelt administration about Fry smuggling Jews out of the country. Um, this, this part of the story was in the Burns film, as, as we all saw. Um, the response of the Roosevelt administration was a telegram sent by Secretary of State Cordell Hull to the American embassy in Paris. And here you see that, um, that Hull instructed the, um, the Paris embassy to inform Fry um, to halt his activities because, and I'm reading from the fifth line from the bottom, he was carrying on activities evading the laws of countries with which the United States maintains friendly relations. This refers us to a crucial aspect of, of the story of America's response to the Holocaust, which is not at all mentioned in the Burns film. And that is that it was the policy of the Roosevelt administration throughout the 30s up until Pearl Harbor to maintain cordial and sometimes friendly relations with Nazi Germany and also with Vichy France. Um, American diplomatic relations, American trade with Germany continued uninterrupted throughout this period. That's why, that's why Hull sent the telegram. It wasn't as if Hull just hated refugees or wanted to be a thorn in Varian Fry's side. Hull's action to stop Fry from carrying on his, his mission was a um, was an articulation of the ongoing policy of President Roosevelt to maintain, as he put it, friendly relations with the Hitler regime. Marty, in in, in the in the course of um, of researching rescue efforts, um, 
I know that you interviewed a number of refugees and, um, and that there were, there were one or more fascinating stories that ultimately you could not include in the film just because of space limitations. And I wonder if you could, if you could briefly share um, one of those uh, stories that, uh, that ended up on the cutting room floor. Sure, uh, there, there are always a, a number of, of, of stories, as you, as you say, that you wish that you could include and you just can't, but they stay with you for years. Um, uh, I will see how much time we have, but I'll, t I'll tell you one of, one of them. To begin with, um, there was a gentleman uh, who I met whose name was uh, Simon Geldworth and, and he lived in Brooklyn. And this is now maybe in 1991 when I, when I met him. And, um, and, and he told this, he told, he told me the story. Um, at the time he was living in, at, at, at the time being in, in, uh, in 38, he was living in, in Vienna. He, and uh, he lived in Austria. And um, this is shortly after the Anschluss, after Germany moved into Austria and took over. Um, he was a young man, about 17 or 18 years old. And, um, and he was also a, a political activist, a community organizer in the Jewish community. Um, and he was a Zionist and a socialist and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and, uh, uh, and Jews were now under pressure to, to, to leave, to get out, and as people were trying to do. Um, and um, one night he's in his, part, is in his apartment, late at night, and suddenly there's banging at the door. It's the Gestapo. The Gestapo's there, and they haul him off in the, like 2 o'clock in the morning for a meeting somewhere. He gets hauled off into this meeting and he meets this person that he's having the meeting with and it's Adolf Eichmann. And, and Eichmann is annoyed and perplexed and he's saying to him, what's with you people? I don't understand. What, what's wrong with you people? Why don't you leave? We've, we've made it as, 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 as miserable as possible for you. Why don't you just get out? And Simon is trying to explain to him that we're trying to get out, but there are problems. There is, it's very hard to find places to go. Palestine shut down. The uh, America is not easy to get into. And he's, he's explaining this to Eichmann almost as though he's schooling Eichmann in this whole immigration process. Like Eichmann is, is not aware about it at all. And Eichmann is just angry and, and just sort of says to him, well, you know, if I don't see improvement soon, you know, there better be improvement. And so Simon leaves, a few, few more weeks go by and immigration is slow. There's nothing much to, that can be done about it. In the middle of the night, again, even later, like three, three four o'clock in the morning, Gestapo back, bingo, back to, back to another meeting with Eichmann. I guess Eichmann was too busy with his day job persecuting Jews to have normal hours to, to meet him. So it always had to be like three or four o'clock in the morning. So he says, uh, uh, you know, I don't see any improvement from a few weeks ago. You know, there's gotta be improvement. You Jews have got to get out of here faster. And, and, and Simon said, and we're trying and, and Simon, and Eichmann says to him, if, if I don't see an improvement here, you're gonna spiel mit Dachau, he says to him. And, end of meeting. The next morning, um, Simon sees a buddy of his and he relates what happened last night. And the buddy says, oh boy, man, th this is trouble. You, you really are in danger here. Uh, you've got to find a way to get out. And the following day, following day, Simon flees to Switzerland. That's the end of it. Thank so you it's this yes. story like that, that you wish you, you could put in the film, but yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. I'd like to conclude with a, a brief discussion of the most famous aspect of America's response to the Holocaust, and that is the failure, I should say the refusal of the Roosevelt administration to bomb the railway tracks leading to Auschwitz and the bridges uh, or the gas chambers and crematoria themselves. Now, as we saw in the Burns film, um, his perspective, Burns' perspective was to uh, make it seem as if 
that wasn't really um, a feasible option. Um, that that it really couldn't have been done. And and Burns presented the Roosevelt administration's explanations and excuses as if they were um, they were facts. The the reality of what happened was that in the late spring of 1944. Um, American Jewish organizations began asking the Roosevelt administration to bomb those targets leading to Auschwitz or in Auschwitz. And, um, and U.S. officials responded by saying it was impossible to do because it would require diverting U.S. bombers from battle zones far away. And they couldn't do that. They couldn't undermine the war effort. Um, but we know, um, in fact, and Jewish leaders knew at the time that uh, American planes were already flying over Auschwitz. In this photo you're looking at, this aerial reconnaissance photo, was taken in preparation for American bombing raids on a section of the Auschwitz camp, um, the industrial zone where there were IG Farben factories manufacturing synthetic oil for the German war effort. And the teenage Ellie Wiesel was one of the slave laborers in, in that site. So. The planes did reconnaissance and then they carried out bombing raids. So they were there over Auschwitz at the very moment that Roosevelt administration officials were telling Jewish leaders, we can't do it because we can't bring planes to that area. Uh, we also saw in the Burns film a very exaggerated discussion about the question of a risk to the prisoners in Auschwitz if there were to be bombing raids. To begin with, that whole idea that that um, that the issue of civilian casualties was a factor is, is completely um, it's really not a fantasy. It was not what the U.S. officials said at the time when Roosevelt administration officials rejected bombing requests. They never said we can't do it because we might kill civilians. In fact, it would have been absurd to say that because when they bombed the oil factories in the Auschwitz industrial zone, they did in broad daylight when the workers, the slave laborers were there and some of them were injured or killed in those raids. But that didn't stop the um, the U.S. from hitting those targets. Um, moreover, of course, bombing the railway tracks and the bridges leading to Auschwitz would not have involved any risks to, to civilians. In the Burns film, we were told by one of the um, commentators that um, that railways could be repaired quickly. Um, and that was sometimes true, sometimes not. And quickly is, is a kind of a loose word. Sometimes it might have taken a number of hours when you think about the fact that 12,000 Jews were being gassed in Auschwitz every day, an interruption of the deportation trains for even some hours, half a day, could have made a big difference. But they completely skipped over in the Burns film, completely skipped the question of bridges. Along those railway routes, there were bridges, and bridges were very difficult to repair. Sometimes they couldn't be repaired at all. And that's why U.S. bombers were constantly hitting railway tracks and bridges throughout Europe. They simply were never willing to hit the railway tracks and the bridges that Jewish groups were asking them to strike in order to interrupt the deportation process. Many of the requests for bombing went through, um, came across the desk of John Paley, who was the director of the War Refugee Board, the small U.S. government agency um, that um, American Jewish groups work with to try to facilitate um, rescue of Jews. Here in this photo, we see John Paley with two of his colleagues. Um, immediately to uh, Paley's right is Josiah Du Bois. Um, the two of them um, did heroic work um, in, the, in the final months of the war to try to rescue Jews um, without almost any support from the rest of the administration and only the most minimal funding. But um, Marty, I know you had the unique opportunity, which Ken Burns did not, to actually meet with John Paley and to interview him about his recollections of this whole discussion about the possibility of bombing uh, the railways to Auschwitz. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that experience of actually meeting and interviewing John Paley. Sure. Uh, he was, um, at, at the time that I met him, he was just retiring from um, a law firm that he was part of um, and looking forward to a, a future life with the one great passion that he had, which is playing golf. Um, and he was a kind, uh, clear-headed, um, uh, gracious man. Uh, for, for example, uh, we talked about uh, where we might actually do the, the, the filming, the interview, and uh, his law office was too 
too crowded, too cramped, and too noisy. And he suggested, well, why don't you come to uh, why don't you come to our home, and 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 do it there. So we did, and this is uh, October of ninety uh, one, when we did the interview with him, and uh, and he spoke about the not only the bombing issue, but he talked about some of the things that you alluded to a moment ago about about other about the other heroic things that that he and his colleagues at the Treasury did in terms of moving things in the direction of actually creating the War Refugee Board to begin with. And uh, and he was very forthright about about the bombing issue and 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 his answer basically told us the extent to which other government agencies were not willing participants to help the War Refugee Board, how much they were on their own, which was in many ways, I'm sure you could make a long list of all the ways that the War Refugee Board just had to act on its own. But, um, but he, he spoke, he, he shared his recollections about, about the bombing and, and that's what we include in, in our story. And I think that we have a clip of that here and, and it should just speak for itself. Auschwitz was located in a strategic oil refining district in Poland. The refineries were no farther than 45 miles from these crematoria. After we recommended to the War Department that the extermination facilities at Auschwitz be bombed, we were told that this was not possible. When we pursued this further, we were told that this would involve bombers being sent from England <clears throat> and that jet fighters could not escort bombers that far and therefore it was not possible to do this. Later, perhaps after the war, we discovered that at the very time we were recommending this, bombing all around Auschwitz was going on from Italy. And we had been misled. Some 2,800 bombers targeted the oil refineries during the months when 150,000 Jews were being gassed. On two occasions, fleets of heavy bombers actually flew past the gas chambers, aiming for the IG Farben fuel factory less than five miles away. A few bombs accidentally hit Auschwitz itself, killing 85 prisoners, civilians, and SS guards. This photograph makes clear the War Department refused to consider the destruction of Auschwitz as part of its mission. The most famous American eyewitness to the refusal to bomb Auschwitz was George McGovern, the U.S. Senator and 1972 Democratic presidential nominee, was a pilot in World War II, and he was one of those pilots who flew bombing missions over Auschwitz to hit the oil factories in 1944. Some years ago, when my colleagues and I at the David Wyman Institute became aware of McGovern's role, we sent a camera crew out to South Dakota to interview him. Filmmakers Chaim Hecht and Stuart Erdheim sat with McGovern and discussed his experiences. McGovern said very frankly that um, they could have hit the railways and bridges um, or done a precision bombing raid and struck those gas chambers and crematoria. He thought there was a pretty good chance, as he put it, that that would be successful. And, um, and I brought this interview, which, by the way, has been widely publicized. It's on the Wyman Institute website and, and elsewhere. I brought the interview to the attention of Ken Burns and his staff um, quite a while ago when they first were working, they began work on the film. And I assume that they would naturally want to include McGovern's recollection since he was there. Um, and yet, if you saw the Burns film, you know that for whatever reason, um, this uh, most important eyewitness to the refusal to bomb the railways to Auschwitz was not included in the film. Um, with that, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask Olivia to uh, to moderate some uh, questions that Marty and I will be glad to take in our remaining time. Wonderful. So I do encourage our audience members to put their questions into the chat box. We don't recognize raised hands, unfortunately. So you will have to type out your questions. I have been uh, collecting your questions. Um, so far, but feel free to add more. Uh, so, but um, while you're adding your questions, let me tell our audience about what we have upcoming at the Susan Mendez Foundation. 
So, of course, we're coming up on Rosh Hashanah, so we have no program this Sunday. But the following Sunday, we have our next program, and that's going to be a fascinating one. It's a film called Secret Lives, Hidden Children and Their Rescuers During World War II. It's a film by Aviva Slesson, who's an Academy Award winning filmmaker. And we're going to talk all about this issue of hidden children during the Holocaust. And it's a very tender and touching film and you will definitely want to see it. Um, you will get an email after today's program with information on how to sign up for that October 2nd program. And then we have further programs coming up in, in later October, November, and December, which you can find on our website. So right now, let me turn to audience questions. And one of the questions is about the country of Canada. The question is, could any of the Jews on the St. Louis or any other Jewish refugees have sought sanctuary in Canada during the 30s? or 40s, what was Canada's policy? Well, as a matter of fact, after the St. Louis was turned away from the United States, its, um, its route took it past the coast of Nova Scotia. And there was a brief um, attempt to see if the Canadian authorities would admit the refugees there, um, but the Canadian government said no. There is a, a famous book written about Canada's response to the Holocaust called None is Too Many. That phrase is a quotation from a, uh, a senior Canadian government official um, from uh, discussing the question of how many refugees they might be prepared to admit. Uh, Canada ultimately accepted very, very few refugees, although, um, as we all know, uh, large sections of Canada are very thinly populated and certainly there was room for them, just as there was room for them in the United States. Um, but sadly, Canada um, took a very uh, hard line regarding uh, the plight of the Jews in Europe. Okay, um, uh, so there's a question about uh, quota numbers and particularly about the country of Hungary. So what about Hungarian visas? W were those quotas filled? Not only Hungary, but also um, other countries in, uh, in Central Europe um, all had you know, quotas uh, Czechoslovakia, France, and Belgium, and the others. Their quotas were all very small. Um, even Poland, with its huge Jewish population, um, had a, uh, a quota of only a little over 6,000 per year. Those quotas were never filled either, but they were so small to begin with that even had they been filled, it would have only, um, it would have only helped a, a, a modest number of people. The German quota, by contrast, although not huge, at 26,000 a year, had it been filled, Ultimately, that would have meant several hundred thousand Jews coming to the United States from Germany alone. Okay, so there was discussion in the Ken Burns film, and it's not only Ken Burns, right? It was three filmmakers who made that film, Ken Burns and, and two others. Um, so they speak about how there was a lack of precision in bombing in those days. Is that accurate? Can you comment on that, please? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, the Allies did carry out many precision bombing raids. Um, some were successful and some were failures. Um, the fact that many of them were failures did not stop the Allies from continuing to carry out those kinds of attacks where appropriate. Um, a very famous attack that was very successful using precision bombing was a raid on the Amiens prison in France to rescue uh, a group of, of Allied POWs. In fact, the Amiens raid was uh, so well publicized that Jewish groups in the United States cited it um, and, and used it as a, a basis to ask the Roosevelt administration to carry out a similar attack on Auschwitz. Um, and the same thing, by the way, is true about success and failure when it came to hitting railways and bridges. Um, as George McGovern explained in the interview, sometimes it was hard to hit the railways or bridges. Sometimes he had to fly back several times to hit a particular target, but that never deterred the United States from carrying out um, raids on railways and, and, and bridges throughout Europe. That was part of the war effort. So although it, it may sound, um, it, it's kind of simplistic to, to say in retrospect, well, those kinds of things wouldn't have worked. Well, it, they were part of the American war strategy and sometimes it worked and sometimes they didn't. 
The tragic reality in the case of targets related to the plight of the Jewish refugees is that the Roosevelt administration was not even willing to try. I, we've mentioned, by the way, that the raids on the industrial zone of Auschwitz. There was also a U.S. air raid on a military factory at Buchenwald, in which um, American planes struck again in broad daylight, knowing, therefore, that the factory making uh, the rockets that they were uh, targeting, the factory was going to be filled with Jewish slave laborers that didn't deter the Americans from hitting it. There was a very successful raid, although they killed um, several hundred of the, of the Jewish uh, inmates who were in the factories at the time. The Roosevelt administration considered that to be an acceptable uh, price to pay for hitting a military target. So the question is, from one of our audience members, wasn't Breckenridge Long the obstructor? FDR, after all, did not have the power of a monarch. FDR did not have the power of a monarch. He had the power of any president, which is to decide immigration policy and then to instruct the State Department to implement it. We know from Breckenridge Long's private diaries that Long regularly briefed the president on specific methods that he and his colleagues were using to suppress Jewish immigration. Um, it wasn't as if uh, Long was, uh, was the secret president. Roosevelt was the president. Long implemented his policies. And in the case of Roosevelt, as in the case of any president, if his secretary of state or Long, his assistant secretary of state, had been carrying out policies that were in defiance of what Roosevelt wanted, he would have fired them. That's what presidents do with rebellious um, lower level officials. But in fact, Secretary of State Hull, Secretary of War Stimson, Assistant Secretary of State Long, um, they were carrying out Roosevelt's policies. We know it from the documents. It's not something that I recently discovered. David Wyman wrote about this in great detail in um, his book, The Abandonment of the Jews, which to this day is still the authoritative study of America's response to the Holocaust. So one of my colleagues on the board of the foundation is in the audience and she comments that um, this makes us ever prouder of somebody like our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes, who defied his government and rescued so many refugees by opening an escape hatch through Portugal that didn't previously exist. And I'm wondering uh, what your take is on Souza Mendes and other such heroes. Well, I too um, derive great personal inspiration from the courageous work of the handful of diplomats in Europe um, who, including the illustrious namesake of your foundation, um, who ri sometimes risk their lives, certainly risk their careers to try to save Jews. A handful of American citizens also um, made such courageous efforts. We spoke briefly about Vary and Fry earlier. Um, and there were others who helped Fry, such as the, um, the diplomat uh, Harry Bingham. Um, and there were a handful of other Americans who were involved either in Fry's rescue network or undertook other efforts um, in Europe. And there was also, I should point out, um, the important example of Raoul Wallenberg. Raoul Wallenberg, who, as we all know, went to German-occupied Budapest in 1944 and saved more than 100,000 Jews, was able to undertake that mission only because the War Refugee Board sent its representative in Sweden to find somebody who was willing to go to Budapest. That was not an easy thing to do. The War Refugee Board, in turn, only came into existence because of pressure from Jewish rescue activists, such as the uh, political action committee known as the Bergson Group, um, pressure from uh, members of Congress who supported rescue, pressure from Henry Morgenthau and his staff at the Treasury Department, um, and from the 400 rabbis who carried out the only march in Washington during those years to try to put pressure on the Roosevelt administration to, um, to create that government rescue agency. So there were those who spoke out, whether in the halls of power in Washington lobbying for rescue, um, whether those who, who marched in the streets, those brave souls who actually went to Europe and, and personally rescued people. And, um, and we all need to, to remember and study um, they're great examples of moral courage and, and the lessons that we can learn so that future generations will not abandon the Jews as the Roosevelt administration did. So I'm going to combine two questions. One audience member says, please address the American Jewish 
community response. And someone else is asking specifically about your opinions on Rabbi Stephen Wise. I'll briefly address those two very big questions in the, in the last few minutes that we have here. Rabbi Wise was the most prominent American Jewish leader of his era. He was the head of multiple Jewish organizations, and he also had much more access to President Roosevelt and the White House um, than other leaders of Jewish groups in those days. But access, as we know, unfortunately does not always equal influence. And, um, and Franklin Roosevelt was a great charmer. He knew how to flatter Rabbi Wise to make him feel important, but then discard Wise's appeals to, to try to rescue Jews from the Holocaust. Rabbi Wise was, um, was a compromised Jewish leader, which is to say, that on the one hand, of course, um, he wanted very desperately to help the Jews in Europe. At the same time, he was very loyal to President Roosevelt, to the Democratic Party, to the New Deal. He didn't want to see, he didn't want to see any criticism in the Jewish community of any of Roosevelt's policies. So Wise was constantly conflicted and often found himself trying to persuade others in the Jewish community um, that they should keep quiet and not give Roosevelt a hard time, that Roosevelt was doing his best. Fortunately, there were those in the, in the American Jewish community who were not willing to keep quiet. Those such as the Bergson Group, whom I just mentioned, who sponsored many full page newspaper ads and lobbied Congress and, and, and organized protests and that organized that march by the 400 rabbis. So American Jews were sadly were very divided, conflicted in, in, those, in those days, um, but they weren't all silent. There were those who did speak out, and they made a difference because the activities of the Bergson Group, in particular, played a decisive role in forcing Roosevelt to create the War Refugee Board, and in turn, the War Refugee Board really performed miracles during the final 15 months of the war. Yeah, and the and the Burn, I think the Burns film does just although they introduce the Bergsons, they they don't really come to the that's that correct conclusion about how persuasive they were as a force to help create the War Refugee Board. That's a, that's a big omission in that, in that film. I agree, and, and I think it's, it's worth noting that President Roosevelt and his administration fought tooth and nail against the proposals to create the War Refugee Board. When the resolution was introduced in Congress, they sent their Assistant Secretary of State to testify against it, to try to stop it. It was only because of a combination of public protests and behind the scenes pressure, including from Secretary Morgenthau, that Roosevelt finally in an election year decided to create that war refugee board, but he gave it almost no funding. Remarkably, 90% of the board's funding came from private Jewish organizations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's another example in American history where a government agency was almost completely funded by private organizations. Um, but, but once the war refugee board came into existence, it proved what many in the American Jewish community have been saying all along, that there were ways to rescue Jews. It was not true, as FDR was saying, that the only way to rescue Jews would be to win the war. In fact, the work of the War Refugee Board proves that that was in fact false, the, the claim by the administration that rescue was impossible, because ultimately the War Refugee Board played a major role in the rescue of approximately 200,000 Jews during the last months of the war. We can only imagine how many more would have been saved, could have been saved, had the War Refugee Board come into existence only a few months earlier. That is to say, had the administration not been fighting it and slowing it down and delaying its creation. So um, I'm going to ask you two audience questions, and then we're going to get to your final thoughts. So one of the questions has to do with another ship, not the St. Louis. It was a ship called the Kwanzaa that went from Lisbon to the United States in 1940. And that's a very interesting story to us here at the Sousa Mendes Foundation, because the reason that that ship, the Kwanzaa, left from Lisbon in the first place is that the passengers, many of them had visas from our hero, Aristides de Sousa Mendes. That's another ship that was refused entry, but unlike the Kwanzaa, the passengers were ultimately allowed to disembark through the personal intervention of Eleanor Roosevelt. So I wanted to use that uh, anecdote to get you to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, uh, 
attitude. And then there's another question. I'll just give you both questions. Uh, and that is about FDR. If he didn't want to rescue Jews, as you are saying, was what was his motivation? Was he anti-Semitic or was there something else going on? What is your bottom line assessment of Franklin Delano Roosevelt? The Kwanzaa is the, um, was the exception that proves the rule. The reason that an exception was made for the Kwanzaa, um, well, I guess we could say there were three factors. One was it was an extremely small number of refugees, 68 people were um, allowed to disembark. But secondly, you mentioned it was 1940. Um, that was an election year. So it was easier to say yes to 68 people than to risk an embarrassing um, you know, controversy in the public eye um, over, over a humanitarian um, issue. Um, and third, of course, the crucial intervention of Eleanor Roosevelt, which leads us to the broader question of, um, of the First Lady's position. She did try in a number of ways, uh, in a number of limited ways, to prod President Roosevelt to be a little more generous regarding the plight of the Jews. Um, in addition to the Kwanzaa, the other notable success of Eleanor's intervention had to do with Varian Fry's rescue mission. She persuaded FDR to, to um, allot 500 emergency visas, as they were called, so that Fry could, could bring refugees from France. Um, she did that not by telling FDR, we need to rescue some of these persecuted Jews from France. No, she did it by saying the refugees in France are the cream of European civilization. Famous writers, scientists, intellectuals, musicians. And that was, that was what convinced FDR to uh, make that one very small gesture. In general, however, we know that, um, that President Roosevelt did not often take the advice of the First Lady, not just with regard to Jews. He's rather famous for being dismissive of her, of her attempts to, um, to facilitate uh, the rights of African Americans. So um, although we, we, we would all wish that she would have made a greater, a greater effort in terms of the plight of the Jews, um, at the same time, it's, it, it, it certainly could be argued that there was not much of a chance FDR would have listened to her um, when she made efforts um, in other areas. When, for example, Eleanor wanted him to endorse the Wagner, Refuge, Wagner Rogers Child Refugee Bill in 1939, which would have permitted the entry of 20,000 German Jewish children, um, Roosevelt refused to say anything in public. And, Eleanor let it be known sort of quietly that she favored the bill. She didn't make a big public issue of it. Now, as to the broader question of FDR's motives, well, every, every president um, is moved by a combination of factors, some political, some personal. Um, every president has to consider um, how any policy decision will affect his chances for reelection or how it might affect his other, other aspects of, of his legislative agenda, let's say. Um, but there are always par personal considerations as well. Inevitably, um, a president's personal inclinations will have some effect in some, in, in some policy decisions. When it comes to the question of, of Franklin Roosevelt's attitude toward Jews, um, over the past decade or so, a number of, his, of historians, myself and others, have uncovered about 15 statements that FDR made in public, um, which were indisputably what we would call anti-Semitic. And I'm not using that in a loose way. I'm being, using that in a very cautious way um, because they were statements which were, first of all, made to friends of his in private settings. The, the sources we have are not um, political enemies of, of Roosevelt trying to embarrass him either then or later. These are statements which were quoted in the diaries of Roosevelt administration officials, but loyalists, but people who were loyal to him. The statements um, often uh, reflect one of several themes, that Jews um, are not um, trustworthy, they're not completely loyal to the United States, they're domineering, that they can't be allowed to concentrate too much in any given profession or in any particular part of the country, because then they'll try to have an undue influence. At one point in 1941, uh, Roosevelt boasted to Henry Morgenthau of all people, 
that when he, Roosevelt, was on the board of Harvard in the 20s, that he helped impose that quota to restrict the admission of Jewish students because he felt, as he said, you can't have too many Jews trying to dominate the campus. And he also advocated, in other settings, limits on, um, on Jews uh, entering various professions. The, um, the private diary of his vice president, Henry Wallace, includes a remarkable um, um, entry in 1943, where Roosevelt describes to Winston Churchill in a private setting that um, the best way to settle the Jewish question, as he called it, was to spread the Jews out thin and only allow four or five Jewish families in any particular area so that they wouldn't become too dominant. Um, because of, of statements like that and others similar to it, and because there are so many of them, not just one or two, and because he made these statements in the 30s and 40s, not when he was a teenager, historians have to conclude that, um, that an unfriendly sentiment toward Jews, or what we would call anti-Semitism, was a part of Franklin Roosevelt's thinking. Now, the question then becomes, did that influence his policy toward Jewish refugees? And um, I think what we can suspect is that it is certainly possible that it played a role. And the reason is this. If FDR had simply allowed the existing immigration quotas to be filled um, and done nothing further, then at least we would say, well, he didn't go out of his way um, to do something unfriendly to Jews. So it, it's an interesting question. Why, why, why was it his policy to suppress immigration so far below what the existing laws permitted? Similarly, with regard to bringing refugees from Europe to America, the president and his administration constantly claimed there were no ships available, therefore no refugees could come. But we know, and it was known at the time, that ships known as Liberty ships were from America were bringing soldiers and war material to Europe and then returning from, um, from Europe to America empty. In fact, they had to be weighed down with chunks of concrete from the rubble of British cities, bombed out British cities, to serve as ballast so the ships wouldn't capsize. Why not allow Jewish refugees to serve as ballast, so to speak? Or in the case of bombing Auschwitz, if the planes were already flying in that area, why not hit those railway tracks or those bridges? So the fact that the president and his administration went so far out of their way to try to keep Jewish refugees from coming to America, it suggests that that to a man like Roosevelt, whose overall vision of America was a country that should be um, overwhelmingly white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant, Jews were not such a welcome element. Yes, he had a handful of Jewish advisors. They were useful in, in implementing and, and, and planning the New Deal. So they were useful to him. But um, only a certain kind of a Jew could rise to the level of FDR's inner circle. And that was a Jew who never talked about Jewish causes, which is why it was so remarkable when Henry Morgenthau finally did speak up very late in the war. Um, but, but in general, um, Roosevelt's personal attitude towards Jews um, was not particularly sympathetic, and his overall vision of America was not one in which he wanted to have large numbers of Jewish refugees. So, so to the extent that his personal feelings could have affected that, um, the answer is, well, it's possible. Obviously, there were also political and other considerations because immigration was opposed by much of the American public and much of Congress. But, and this is another crucial point, not properly explained in the Burbs film, there was a significant shift of public opinion during the war. All those polls that were emphasized in the Burns film um, from the 1930s showed overwhelming public opposition to immigration, and those kinds of poll results continued in the early 40s. But in the spring of 1944, the White House commissioned a private Gallup poll, which found that 70% of Americans were willing to accept an unlimited number of refugees from Europe for the duration of the war on a temporary basis. Even though the president knew at that time that he had the overwhelming support of the American public, nonetheless, he only admitted one small token shipment of refugees, 982 Jews who were uh, settled in an abandoned army camp in Oswego, New York, upstate New York. Um, so again, that points to the question of, if he knew he had so much public backing, why not at that point um, allow more refugees in temporarily. 
And so it is, sadly, it's possible, it's possible that some of the motivation goes back to his personal feelings in addition to the other uh, political and other considerations that shape presidential decision making. So let me allow both of you to give some final thoughts, and I hope that you will have a note of optimism in those thoughts, because right now my feelings are in a very dark place. <laughs> so um, Marty, maybe we'll start with you. What are the final thoughts you would like to leave with our audience? Okay. Um, I would say that um, uh, in, in view of, of um, this magnum opus, this giant new film that that uh, Ken has done that's caught everybody's attention. That um, that the the good the good part of it. All, I have many uh, misgivings about things that were left out in the film, but I think it is um, beneficial that the whole subject come to our public attention in general, and and the things that are missing can be pointed out as they're being done this evening, for example. And because I do think that 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 there is. Uh, significant hope for us if we have the courage to look at at the dark side of our history. Of, of I think if we know that uh, you know where we've been, that we can better know who we are, and we can ultimately find ways to look more clearly. If we look more clearly at ourselves, I think it ultimately can lead us in the direction of wisdom and compassion. And uh, and that's what I think all these films hopefully we'll do with, with, with people so that we're creating not only a, a vision of a, of, a, of a future that will be better in years to come, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but really just the, uh, just the importance of looking and repairing what's broken right now. And I do think that, that these things, his film, my film can help move us in that direction, in the direction of some hope. Dr. Medoff, Raphael, please leave us with your final thoughts. You know, the Ken Burns film began, the very opening sequence um, had a dramatic statement that um, America took in more refugees during the uh, Nazi period than any other country. Now, that statement was inaccurate to begin with. Um, in fact, the British allowed more Jews both into the United Kingdom and into British Mandate Palestine um, than the United States did. The British allowed in over 315,000 Jews to the territories it controlled, as opposed to America took in about 200,000 during this period. Even the Soviet Union uh, took in more refugees. The Soviets allowed 300,000 um, Polish Jews fleeing from the Nazis to enter, um, enter Soviet territory between 39 and 41. But when we think about um, the broader issues here, it's not just a matter of comparing statistics. It's not just a matter of who had the most. It's also a matter of who could have done more. I've talked um, this evening about the 190,000 unused quota places. I've talked about the ships, the empty ships that could have brought refugees back. I've talked about the, we've discussed the the, the, the planes that were flying over Auschwitz and could have bombed those railway tracks and bridges. So it's those, it's those squandered opportunities that really um, the Burns film did not um, explain or fully describe and, um, and thus leave us wanting. Because what we ultimately need to know is how um, our government, how our president, how our leaders responded in previous times of tragedy in order to try to ensure that we, we as a country do a better job in the future. As we know, the Holocaust was not the last genocide. And um, every generation of Americans finds itself uh, confronted with a moral dilemma similar to that of the 30s and 40s, which is to say, to what extent should America use its uh, resources to help people who are being persecuted in other countries? And during more recent genocides like Rwanda and Darfur, sadly, we saw various uh, presidents, Republicans and Democrats, essentially turn away. What's crucial about, um, about speaking about, speaking honestly and accurately about America's response to the Holocaust is to ensure that future generations do not repeat those mistakes, that 
our children and grandchildren um, do a better job. And don't follow in the footsteps, footsteps of presidents who turned away from genocide, but rather understand that as human beings, we all have a moral responsibility to speak up and to do what we can as a country to try to save innocent people from persecution. That's for sure. And boy, you've enlightened us, but it's such a heavy, heavy topic and it's a history we have to face. Fortunately, we have optimistic, uplifting programs coming up as to serve as some sort of an antidote. Um, we have this beautiful uh, 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 program about the rescue of hidden children. Uh, in fact, my own mother will be one of the panelists. She herself was a hidden child in Belgium during World War II. Mm. So I'm, I asked her and she said yes. That's great. And we're going to feature our own hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes, in a program on October 23rd. And we have other beautiful rescue stories to come. But in the meantime, let me wish our panelists and all of our audience a sweet and beautiful Jewish New Year. And we will see you on the other side. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful New Year. And we'll see you on October 2nd. Thank you and bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.